Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Laura again, your professor. Uh, I want you to know that I'm a family sociologist and a demographer, but one of my jobs is to teach theory to our graduate students in the graduate theory seminar, the required seminar. And so I really do like reading a lot of theory. And so uh, what I'm going to be doing to you in the next few minutes is talking to you a little bit about uh, theories about the structure of power in our society. And I'm going to be talking to you about two theorists who are talking about that. I'm not necessarily asking you to agree with it or, or, or believe that it's true. I'm just presenting different theories. Um, but I'm inviting you to think through how do you think the power structure of our society is organized? And what ways do you look out in the world and see how power is used or abused? So uh, I'm going to do that by starting out by talking to you about a power elite model. So you remember in the last lecture, I talked to you about definitions of power and authority, and I talked to you about ideal types of a uh, kind of charismatic versus traditional versus rational legal. So right now, I'm going to talk to you specifically about thinking through who literally has power, whether it's economic power, or military power, or some form of legislative power, what kind of power is out there. And so if you kind of take a power elite model where you think that there's a small group of people, an elite group of people who have control over a wide group of others, you probably are kind of thinking like a Karl Marx type of person. And so according to Marx, the dominant or ruling class controls all the major institutions of society. And so, for example, Karl Marx argued that the bourgeoisie, they owned factories and they owned wealth, that they could purchase the bodies and the labor of the working class and that they controlled the media and education and the government in order to have their express elite interests met, to set uh, labor uh, laws, to make sure that they had power to break up strikes, they could arrest people who tried to unionize. And so a Marxist model is really a conflict-oriented model that argues that a small group of elites control things. And so according to this kind of perspective, the state itself is simply an instrument by which the ruling class exercises its power. So you remember that in the last lecture, I talked to you about how the state is our government and our economy and the police and the military. And so what this model argues is that that state doesn't necessarily represent the interests of the people it, or the governed. It actually represents the interests of the ruling class. So C. Wright Mills, uh, he's this radical sociologist, uh, uh, and he was really interested in kind of thinking through what's going on with the power elite in his time period. And so he's writing and thinking about this during the 1950s. And so this is a time period where uh, we just won World War II. Uh, we're becoming a global economic superpower. Uh, we're trying to uh, argue that our form of democracy is the best one globally. Uh, and that we also are really proud of our military prowess. And so he's looking around, seeing that, seeing how the United States is becoming a global economic superpower. And so he argues that for the United States, at least starting in the 1950s and then moving forward, we started seeing the, the, the United States turn into a power elite model, where a small group of military, industrial, and governmental leaders controlled the fate of the United States. So if you read his book, The Power Elite, uh, he takes kind of a historical view. And so he looks at the history of the United States and he argues that, hey, for a large part of our time, you saw that uh, a lot of people who live in the United States basically were small, uh, kind of land owning farmers they had uh, you know significant land holdings but not that not major they weren't millionaires because of their farms and that they were distributed in rural areas and that the only way you could really kind of maybe be an elite is maybe you were the town pa uh, pastor or maybe you were the town doctor or the town lawyer um, but even if that was the case it's not like you were living so much better than anyone else around you that you had kind of similar economic and life chances as everyone else but what uh, C. Wright Mills argued is that that changed, that starting in the middle of the 20th century, you started to see that some people, some small group of people, were really able to coalesce large sums of wealth, large sums of ownership of stocks and bonds and companies, uh, and that they controlled large amounts of our military, the decisions that we were making. And so he argued you started seeing the coalescence of power, the concentration of power. And so he even look, kind of looked at it as social patterns. And so what he said is that if you look at the elites, the elites are going to the same Ivy League schools. They're going to the same private schools. Uh, they are getting uh, networks for getting them in the best positions and internships. Uh, they meet and greet and are in the same social circles and party at the same ski resorts. And so they basically are marrying and socializing together and that they share very similar points of view and that their points of view are very dissimilar from everybody else. 
And so basically they're operating as a self-conscious cohesive unit. And so what he also says is that if you're in this elite, you're kind of floating across these three forms of power that you are likely to know a lot of people who are in the military power structure and the industrial and the government leaders. So an example would be Dick Cheney, Pre uh, Vice President Cheney. I don't know if you saw the movie Vice looking at him, um, but at one time he was uh, a CEO for Halliburton. Uh, and Halliburton is a private contractor that gets military contracts to provide services for our military, right? And so he served as a, uh, a member of their board. He also was uh, in the executive branch as vice president at one time. And he also was invited to be on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so he had an enormous amount of influence across both the military, uh, industrial world, and, 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 and the highest forms of government. So that would be an example of what uh, C. Wright Mills calls as the interlocking directorate, that people are kind of floating across these realms. So another example would be kind of maybe Mitt Romney. So Mitt Romney is very wealthy. Uh, he was a very wealthy businessman, uh, but he also served uh, as a senator, right? He's had enormous amount of uh, uh, kind of a, a governmental power too, including being governor of Massachusetts. So that's an example that the small power elite is making major decisions for the rest of us. So there's this another sociologist who says that, you know, that's interesting to think about a concentration of people who have power, but he's not quite as stern or stiff as C. Wright Mills. Domhoff argues that the boundaries between groups are a little bit uh, looser. And so, for example, elites can be part of a corporate community. They can be in Apple or they can be in um, Microsoft. They can be all these different corporations. Um, but we also have people who are elites because they're in policy formation organizations. So, for example, they're at think tanks uh, like a, um, a Heritage Foundation. Uh, or they might just be uh, you know, elites because they're upper class. They're really wealthy. So, for example, Paris Hilton, she might be an elite. She's not necessarily making her own wealth, but she's inherited a vast sum of wealth, and that might be an example. What Domhoff says is that the thing that's interesting, though, is that even though there's different kinds of elites, that if you actually look at the research, that people who are part of these communities still are largely white, male, and upper class. And so what he argues that if you look at these elites in terms of kind of a politics in the United States, that there seems to be like these two kinds of coalitions fighting against each other. One is what he calls the corporate conservative. So a group of elites who are trying to kind of uh, support free market capitalism, uh, the destruction of unions, uh, they, they, they fight against uh, minimum wage laws, uh, they want to have uh, laissez-faire uh, economic uh, rules, and so there's that kind of an elite working towards that, free market economies. And then there's a liberal labor branch. So people who work for think tanks who are trying to support uh, workers' rights, union, health insurance, that kind of thing. And he argues that those are the two major strains. That it's not just kind of uh, conservative elites who are controlling the world, but there's also kind of a liberal elite as well. So here's how it would look if you actually had pictures of it. So according to C. Wright Mills' model, you've got uh, the very top people who are the power elite, the corporate rich, people who are in the executive branch of government, uh, and then military leaders. And then you have a group in the middle, the interest group leaders, the legislators, and local opinion leaders. And then the unorganized exploited masses. That's where you and I are. And so basically we're considered un unorganized and exploited because we don't have much influence on the power elite at all. We have no direct contact with them. Uh, we can't get our voices heard. We might be able to tell legislators or local opinion leaders or interest group leaders what we think about, but the those that middle tier is trying to make appeals to the upper tier and hopefully trying to move up into the upper tier, and so they're not necessarily very interested in helping the, the masses below. And so he really sees it as these really tight breaks between these groups with those at the bottom having no kind of real contact or control over those at the top. Uh, the Domhoff model, on the other hand, is kind of like this concentric circles, this Venn diagram. And so, for example, you can be part of the social upper class alone, or maybe you're in a think tank, or maybe you're in a corporate community, or maybe you are a social upper class who's also doing policy. Uh, and maybe you're all three. Maybe you're that little purple square right in the set, uh, uh, center or triangle. An example of that would be, for example, um, uh, Bill Gates. So Bill Gates, he's uh, you know, he's got Microsoft, and so he's part of the corporate community, and Microsoft has made him very, very wealthy, so he's in the upper class, uh, but he's taken a real strong interest in trying to uh, 
uh, support um, different sorts of policy to help the world. So, for example, he's giving lots and lots and lots of grant money to try to support research on um, malaria research and other health problems that he thinks can be eradicated on Earth. And so he's somebody who's working in all three areas. Uh, you might move across them. Steve Jobs would be another example. He was uh, he formed Apple, and so he was in the corporate community, and Apple made him very rich. He was in the social upper class, uh, and that he tried to impact policy. So, for example, one time he invited uh, President Obama to lunch in order to tell President Obama that they really need to invest in technology and education so that workers in the United States would be prepared for factory jobs and that factories could be built here. So he was trying to have an influence across all three. So the last thing I'm going to say to you is that uh, to think about kind of like the military. I only have one slide on the military. There's so much. There's this sociology of the military. This is a big area of research. Um, but since the next lecture I'm going to give you is on the economy, the main thing I wanted to tell you is that the military is the largest single public employer in the United States. And I think that's really interesting. And so there's about 3.6 million people, men and women, who are serving in the U.S. military across all of the branches. Uh, and that um, they are just shy of about one-third uh, representing uh, minority racial and ethnic groups. And about 12% report uh, Hispanic ethnicity. ethnicity. And so the military is not necessarily totally representing the distribution of the U.S. in terms of gender or race, but it's a very diverse sort of uh, institution, I guess, this military. Um, that's all for now. The next lecture is going to be on the economy. The only thing I want to say is, uh, you know, people who are looking at C. Wright Mill's model now, there's this researcher called Michael Burroway. He argues that uh, things have become even more uh, power elite structure than in C. Wright Mill's time, that you're seeing that those who are wealthy and in control of the corporate world are having a lot more influence on the military and the, uh, and the government, and that their wealth is making them pull away even farther from the unorganized masses, that their CEO salaries and accumulated wealth is way much higher than it was during the 1950s. And so they argue that uh, C. Wright Mill's, if you're writing it now, might even have a, a more extreme kind of model. You can decide for yourself. I encourage you as a young sociologists to use your sociological imagination and decide how you think power is distributed and whether you think that uh, people have different levels of power and that maybe those who are at the bottom tier have an effective use of power. So just kind of give it some thought. That's a, a task for you as citizens. Take care.